bringing you the best wines at the best price and some of the most interesting theological topics on the internet. Welcome back, everybody. I'm Father Justin Waltz. And I'm Father Jaden Nelson. And we're two priests and a, a bottle, bottle of wine. wine. Have a lot of great things for you this episode as we progress in our uh, six offerings that we're going to uh, continue to post on a very regular basis. We find ourselves today outside in beautiful spring, North Dakota. This is uh, our first day of 70 degrees. We have a wonderful beautiful. wine and an extremely interesting topic for you, but let's start with a prayer. In the name of the, the, name Father, of the Father, and of the Son, and of the, and the, Holy, Son of the Spirit. Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Lord God, we ask that you would open the hearts of all those who are watching this episode and heal any pains or wounds that they have from the life that they're living. May you be with us as we speak about Holy Communion, and we entrust all of this to the Blessed Virgin Mary as we pray together. Hail, Hail Mary, Mary, full, full of grace, grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed, blessed art thou amongst women, women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mary Mother of God, God, pray for us sinners, sinners now and at the hour of our death. death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Father Nelson, tell us about the wine. Well, it's I'm excited uh, for this wine because I was recently listening to a podcast, I think it was a wine enthusiast podcast, and they started talking about South African Chardonnays. Uh, I my wheelhouse with wine knowledge is Italy, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm trying to branch out and uh, understand different regions of, of the world uh, with regard to white wines in particular, uh, because I, I just love the varietals that are available in the white wine. And it is uh, summer. And it's summer, and it's time to you know drink, drink some, some whites, some some crisp whites. Uh, in this podcast that they were talking about, talked about the uh, a particular area in South Africa that's been uh, growing wine for, for decades, generations, but has recently kind of gotten into the Chardonnay uh, grape varietal and do, is doing it in a way that's unique, uh, is, is kind of a, a halfway, maybe you could say, between Old World France Chardonnays and uh, the new the new California style Chardonnay that's big on oak, and uh, and and more of a rounded uh, buttery uh, flavor profile, and, and getting more to a purer um, grape uh, experience that's not so buttery. finessed by the oak. Uh, so I mean I think this is an oaked Chardonnay, but I don't think it's going to be heavily oaked. I'm interested in getting into this and just seeing uh, how South African Chardonnay, uh, you know compares with some of the other more traditional Chardonnays. Uh, personally, I love Chardonnays. I love light white wines. We've been talking a lot uh, over the last few episodes just about, you know, tannins and sulfates and uh, processing red wine. And, you know, I, I love wine. I love red wine, but those larger, bigger, fuller, thicker red wines uh, can be a little bit tough on my system. Anything more than about a glass and um, I don't do so well. But the white, Whew, I love the whites, and as summer comes round, uh, we like to open up a white from time to time and enjoy, uh, you know, a little little platter of yeah. cured so this, meat. And this a is a, a Mirlust Chardonnay from the Stellenbosch region in South Africa. Say that five times. Yep, absolutely. Stellenbosch, yeah. Uh, I can tell you right now, the color is absolutely wonderful. I will say we've been going off about um, letting the wine breathe. Uh, when you're dealing with a white, not so much. Uh, they're usually ready right out of the bottle. We like them nice and cold for a little refreshing Christmas to it. Uh, this uh, has a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful color. And it's really uh, golden has a wonderful smell. You can definitely smell that Chardonnay grape in there for sure, but having never had this wine, um, I'm wondering whether or not it has any of that large butterball on it. And it doesn't, which is wonderful. Now, some of you uh, may really like those California big butterball Chardonnays. It's, it really reminds Creamy. Me, yeah, the, yeah, right. They remind me a lot of like, it's like the the red Zinfandel of whites, you know, yes. big full body. So if yep. you're looking for that, that is not this. This no. is going to be more expressive of uh, of the grape itself without all of the oak. Yep, and you're going to find more citrus uh, in this Chardonnay than a lot of other Chardonnays. First drink, I'm finding it incredibly refreshing. Like if you're sitting there watching this and you're saying to yourself, 
I want a refreshing wine yep. on, a, on a beautiful spring day like we're experiencing here in North Dakota. This one is an absolute thirst quencher. It is a thirst quencher. It is not though, a, it's not the the kind of bright acidic Sauvignon Blanc no, style. No, not that much, no. But, it, it, and it's, it, it, but it's pulled back just a level from that kind of more traditional Chardonnay. It's it takes juicy. A lot of the same characteristics I'm getting, but, but in Absolutely a different profile. Absolutely fabulous. For sure. Now before we get into the topic, we want to just sort of examine this a little bit. This is 13% which is a very approachable alcohol content. Many times uh, they can be a little bit higher. Uh, and it is a Chardonnay. Now, Father, could you tell us a little bit about where you purchased it, how much it was? Yeah, you can get this on uh, wine.com amongst other uh, online re retailers. k &L Wines, everyone, is also a very, very good resource for mm -hmm. wines, liquors, you name it. And we're dealing with, uh, I think it's about a $25 bottle of wine. Mm -hmm. So, 25 bucks, wine.com, KNL Wines. You're going to want to get this. And uh, I, would, I would say maybe even a little bowl of cantaloupe, muskmelon. Yep, yep. Uh, a sliced up pear and some light cheese. It, it is uh, amazing, would, though, would really because. Go well, with it. well, it's delivering exactly as it was advertised in the sense that this is a new experience of Chardonnay. Yeah. I have never had a Chardonnay Real, it's that. really good. That, gives me this kind of fruit forward flavor profile with some acidity on the front that makes you yep. want to come back and you know we really want to note especially after our last episode on Fatima that we're going to start focusing in on wines that we really want you to try mm -hmm. so we already have a, a predisposition disposition that the wine's going to be good the last one that we did there it just wasn't good um, and so we're hoping that they're all going to be good, but we haven't had them yet. We're going to be tasting them with you uh, on, on these videos. Yep. But we'll hopefully be able to make a solid recommendation so that you're able to go out and spend that money and say, I know I'm going to get a really good wine. One of the things also, for those of you who are diet conscious, conscious out there, mm -hmm. that we, we just discovered this through a conversation a couple of weeks ago, is this, that when you think about wine, you might think heavy carbs. Exactly. But not no, and we're light carb people here at uh, St. Leo's. It's, it's not like drinking, you know, five beers. Yep, yep, way less than beer. As a matter of fact, you can almost stay in keto with just, you know, not a lot of wine, but with a little wine. It's an amazing thing. Beer I think is going to be a little bit. They were saying carb. something like, you know, two two grams of carbs per yeah bottle of wine or something like, or maybe glass of wine. But so as always, we're going to uh, just enjoy this as we get into our topic which we got a little bit of a controversial one for you it's yeah. the reception of holy communion now we thought about many different angles with this because this is obviously a very politically charged topic uh, in which there are some very zealous uh, and strong opinions I think on on both sort of edges of the sword uh, faces of the coin on how people feel about this, both in the lay faithful as well as in the presbyterate and the episcopacy, uh, all the way up to the Vatican. So a lot of the times we read about issues like this and just due to, uh, you know, a lack of teaching, you know, from us priests, we don't really understand the issue that we're talking about. So we thought we would start in, in a very basic way uh, regarding the reception of Holy Communion itself, when and when not uh, any particular Catholic should or shouldn't be receiving uh, the Blessed Sacrament. So first, the reason why it, it is, you know, a level of such depth is because, as Vatican II said uh, so well, I believe that maybe it's the Catechism, that the, the Eucharist is the source and summit of the Catholic faith. Why? Because we as Catholics believe that the bread and wine transubstantiate through the prayers of consecration prayed by a validly ordained priest in the Holy Mass into literally the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus himself. Jesus being the second person of the Trinity who is actually God. So without Jesus, there is no Christianity. And uh, without the Holy Eucharist, there is literally no catholic faith or no catholic no, no church yeah no church so the, it's the, the source, eucharist makes the church i think source, thomas said source and summit so if it's actually god not just who is him and not just uh 
you know, a symbol or a, a communion rite or an expression of faith, the various things that we can say. If it's actually Jesus, the reason why we either do or do not receive him is because we are coming in to communion, hence we call it communion, with Almighty God himself every time that we receive uh, the Blessed Sacrament. So as a norm, it is in the positive. If we are Catholic and we are at Catholic Mass, then it is Jesus' great joy to love us by coming into communion with us in such a profound intimacy that it's the resurrected body within our bodies, yeah. body to body, soul to soul, spirit to spirit, uh, in which it is not only a great joy to receive him, but it is also a great joy on behalf of God to be received. So by all means, in the right conditions, which we presume are the case most of the time, then we should be receiving Holy Communion. Now certainly there's practices over the, the, the history of the church where people increase their desire for receiving Holy Communion by maybe not receiving Holy Communion, but I think it's pretty clear from Vatican II on that, that receiving well, Holy e Communion is what we should even, be doing. Even before that, Pius X, uh, right. who no, the nobody would say that Pius X was a modernist or, or some sort of, you know, unorthodox. Explain that. He's the one who lowered the age, right? Or yeah, so Pius X, uh, at the time that he was the Pope, uh, wanted everybody to recognize the importance of receiving communion frequently. And he, in fact, lowered the age of receiving uh, the Eucharist to the age of reason, which is seven years old, basically. Uh, which then allowed people to receive at an earlier age because he thought that as the, the, the fully initiated um, portion of, of you know the Catholic faith that the children, once they reach the age of reason, should have this strength that comes from the Eucharist and this closeness with the Lord. Uh, and, and as a result of that really proposed or promoted uh, frequent reception of Holy Communion. Right, so we, as we begin this discussion, really want to emphasize that the norm is to receive Holy Communion. Jesus wants you to receive Holy Communion if, if we are in the proper state, which Correct. brings us to the second part of what we want to talk about, because we, we know as Catholics that we're sinners in need of a Savior. And unfortunately, even after baptism, that we continue to sin. And sometimes we can sin in very grievous ways, which, you know, divides our relationship with God. So if you're already spiritually in the right state, you're in communion with him. And this is, you know, a, a profound intimacy that you come into by receiving Holy Communion, body to body. We can, however, though, be in the state of mortal sin. Father, could you explain the difference between mortal sin and venial sin to us? Well, mortal sin and venial sin are two different. Um, they're, they're two different kinds of sin in the sense of judging the sin by the effect that it has on one's state relationship with God. So, if once you're baptized, uh, whether you're baptized as an infant or you're baptized as an adult, the the you are in the state of grace. You are an in the Holy Trinity itself indwells you by a temple, a temple of the Holy Spirit. You have a new relationship of charity with God in which he says, like in the beautiful chapters of John's gospel that we've been reading recently, I do not call you slaves any longer, but I call you friends. And maybe even a better word is family. Yep. It's a family that we belong to God's But the family. word that Jesus uses in the gospel of John is friends, right? <laughs> so uh, this this sense of being uh, close associates and, and, and uh, even peers, right? Thomas Aquinas in his Summa asks whether or not charity his friendship with God. And one of the things that has always touched me is that he, he responds by saying that what charity does when we have the virtue of theological charity in our heart is that it, Jesus actually elevates us to a level of being a peer with him. Even though our creaturely status doesn't go away, by grace, we share a, a certain ability to associate with God as equals or peers. Um, and this is a, a tremendous gift of grace. It's nothing that we do on our own. But the result of this is that there's this new relationship in our lives. In order for that relationship to be maintained, we have to continue to abide within this relationship of love of God above all things and, and not choose anything contrary to the love of God that's contrary in a serious way. 
of which we call the sin that divides that grave, mortal mortal grave, sin mortal sin but it's based upon grave matter right meaning it's a it's a human action yep. that is a violation of the ten commandments and so it it severs our relationship with God now for lack of a you know sometimes we can theologically make this into almost a, something that's ununderstandable if you want to understand this in in a human expression I say I say it's like this I think it's like a husband and a wife Husband goes out and commits adultery, that's a mortal sin. So that's going to really wreck that relationship. And venial sin then is less than that, so it's a fight that they have, but they can get reconciled a little bit quicker. Adultery is a really big deal. Now the thing with God is God forgives quickly and perfectly. We just need to repent and then come to confession, confess that sin, which is mortal, and we're back in the state of grace. Restore the right relationship. Exactly. So the point is this, everyone. A Catholic should not be receiving Holy Communion, don't care who you are, if you have done what your conscience, uh, or better... Informed by the teaching of the Church. Informed by the teaching of the Church is telling you that you have committed a mortal sin, meaning that you've freely chosen the thing, you knew it was grave matter, and it was grave matter, and you did it. So, that's as easy as missing Sunday Mass. It's as easy as using God's name in vain. Also could be killing someone could be the act of adultery, things like that. Point is, is until we've gone to confession after committing that mortal sin and repented of the action, it would be very similar to a spouse committing adultery, ignoring the fact that they had done it, even though the spouse knew it, and then showing up for intimacy after that sin had been committed. Clearly, that would never happen. So when we have divided our relationship with God, have not repented from the thing, not gone to confession, we have no right to come up and present ourselves for Holy Communion until we have reconciled with God. Now, this is the whole Catholic life, right? At the end of the day, this is life in general, right? We're sinners, we're a fallen creatures, so we fall into things, priests included, and we have to go to confession. But we're in the perpetual state of repentance, meaning that we're going to confession, we're trying to live the best life that we can. Hopefully, firm not purpose of amendment. Firm purpose of amendment. We don't want to do this thing anymore. So we've gotten a confession. We get it figured out. We go back to Holy Communion. However, there are certain situations that make in which we can find difficult. ourselves in a compromised situation in which, number one, we're unwilling to repent. Number two, until we go through a particular process, which really is repentance. Yep. We we got to walk the process until we get back to the altar, so to speak. Now, yep. I just want to touch on those a little bit uh, because actually um, some of the stuff we're going to talk about briefly here at the end, uh, the Vatican is saying, you know, in regards to reception of Holy Communion, there's a whole variety of things that people can fall into that they should repent from before they come back to Holy Communion. You can't just isolate certain stuff. Okay, more about that in a second. The one that would be clearest is, let's, let's say um, you're a young individual and you're in love and you're in a relationship in which you're fornicating. And you say, I'm going to continue to fornicate and I'm not going to go to confession. As a matter of fact, I might, even be, I might even move in with the person. Cohabitation. Cohabitation. Should a person go to Holy Communion if they are in that situation perpetually? No. No, they should not. Should they still come to Mass? Absolutely. Yes. But they're in a discernment mode where they're probably saying we should get married, which is the answer to that. They get married, they go to confession, they no longer can commit fornication, and they have the right to be living together. But as long as, or they could move out, and they could commit yeah. to living, you know, a, a pure life as a couple, and, and, and go to confession, and go to communion, and if they might fall again, but they would go to confession, and then they can come back to it. But you can't be living this thing over here, and at the same time, pretending as it doesn't exist and coming up for Holy Communion. Right. Again, always keep in mind the relationship. Like a spouse committing adultery, spouse knows about it, you, then you demand physical intimacy that night. Crazy unjust, right? God loves us, wants us to repent, we'll forgive anything, but we have to repent. Level two of this would be somebody who is married, divorced, maybe for reasons that, uh, you know, nobody needs to get into that dis discussion, they divorce. They found someone new, they got married outside the church, they didn't get an annulment, and now they're in an, in, in an irregular union. And what do we do? Well, they can't come up for Holy Communion. As a matter of fact, they can't even go to confession. So the first 
stage that we want, or the first you know step that we need to enter into is the annulment process. Correct. So they get an annulment, they come to the priest, we can validate the legal marriage that they're in, meaning we sacramentalize it, meaning that they're really married in the church. Up until that point, they're not. Yeah, the civil the civil <coughs> marriage uh, has civil effects, but as a, a natural marriage, as a baptized Christian, it's not a sacramental marriage, which means that you must in a be perpetual state of either fornication or adultery, which is the grave matter in sin. Yep. So you can't come to Holy Communion until we get you out of that. You can't even come to confession because you're not technically repenting of it. Correct. So after the annulment, convalidation of the marriage, you, we hear your confession, boom, you're back going to Holy Communion. Okay? Yep. The third stage of it is that you are publicly supporting, and in the case of the political realm, you would be a Catholic who is publicly supporting, with your vote, something that is gravely immoral. Correct. Like abortion. And some of the top tier stuff, when we get into what we refer to as, as an intrinsic evil, something that is perpetually always evil. There is no... The murder of the innocent. No good that could ever come from it. Euthanasia. It's demonic. Abortion. Assisted suicide. Euthan S sorcery. Sorcery. Uh, many, many different things. But the two that are front and center, and the reason why we're having this topic, really, are Catholic politicians that are publicly and perpetually in support of grave moral evil, evils such as abortion and euthanasia. Now, what happens with this? Well, that's really what the question becomes. If we look at both Pope John Paul II and Pope Benedict, they would say that uh, the pastor, you know, so I have parishioners in my parish, the pastor should go to this particular politician, have a good conversation with them, and privately, because we like to keep things uh, discreet when we're dealing with sin and repentance, privately approach the individual, explain to them why the church does not support these things and why therefore as a Catholic they can't either, and hopefully the person repents, goes to confession, you're welcome at Holy Communion. If the person cannot reconcile their faith and their public actions, then as long as the individual is supporting the grave evil publicly, they're not, they, by their own uh, conscience should not present themselves for Holy Communion because they are choosing to support this particular way, unrepentant uh, of abortion or euthanasia, and therefore willfully uh, are abstaining from Holy Communion because of that support. Father, Father Waltz, is it? Um, it seems to me that there's another angle on this which is important to bring up, which is that, that public acts and private acts are treated differently. Correct within the way that we approach how we deal pastorally with things. So, for example, like people have a right to their good name. Mm -hmm. uh, and if, if I am detracting, you know, about you all over town, uh, and I go to confession, the pastor or the priest is going to, uh, at some level, encourage me to make restitution for your good name that I've ruined by um, by writing the wrong, so to speak, when possible. Exactly. So it's not good enough for me to, you know, badmouth you uh, amongst my peers, go to confession and then not say anything and leave them in a state of thinking that that what I said in the first place is still the state. Right. right? So when we're dealing with this particular topic, the issue at hand is these are megaton Public. public acts that all Catholics are looking at that Catholic politician who's a sp supporting abortion yep. and they're saying how is it that you can do that gravely immoral act and go to communion and still go to communion and the answer to that is you can't if you want to support the act then you should self-regulate and not go to communion until you're ready to repent the problem is when you have a person or people that support that and then present themselves for Holy Communion and that's where the church needs to get involved Starts at the pastor. The pastor would tell you, as long as you persist in the sin, don't present, present yourself for Holy Communion, or I will not give you Holy Communion because you are not in the state of grace in well, which you can receive it. So, and that's that's a bit of a... So, my understanding on this is that it's not so much that we know that a person is not in the state of grace... It's that the, the actions are public and manifest and obstinate and clearly contrary to the teaching of the church and what Jesus, who Jesus is and what he stands for. 
and and so it's not so much re- withholding holy communion in that case is not as i understand it a judgment about the subjective culpability that a person has but rather a regulation of yeah, I would order agree with that because you can't really say whether somebody's in mortal sin or not. Within, but, but it is a grave evil. That so, so Canon nine fifteen is where the church, in its law, which every pastor is bound to every to Catholic. follow this. Every Catholic is bound to follow this, right? It says Canon nine fifteen says this: those who have been excommunicated or interdicted. Okay, so excommunication can happen for various reasons within the church. It can be a formal ex- excommunication that's public and manifest. It could be what's called the late sententiae excommunication, which happens simply because I've committed a particular action that by the nature of that action in the law excommunicates me if I'm over the age of 14 or 18 and I'm able right. I'm anyway, not gonna, we're not going to get into that. That's a whole topic under That's itself. a whole topic topic under itself. But that's what excommunication means is that you can't receive communion in the sacraments. You can't have a communion in any of the sacraments including penance until that excommunication is lifted and then you have access again to the sac- the holy things, the sacraments, right? Interdict is a is a penalty basically that's imposed. Maybe that's not the the perfect juridical word. I'm not a canon lawyer, but it's imposed from the top down on a on a territory. So let's say, for I know example, you like canon law, but this is going on for a while. Here. So let's say, but just to know what interdict is, a bishop would say for a, a, to a, 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 an area, you you people can't receive the sacraments here right. for some reason. I'm not getting into that now, but uh, those who have been excommunicated or interdicted after the imposition or declaration of the penalty, and others, and this is where it's pertinent to our situation or others obstinately persevering in manifest grave sin are not to be admitted to Holy communion, Holy communion. So obstinately persevering in manifest grave sin. Translation. If you are publicly voting in support of euthanasia or abortion as a Catholic, you are excommunicated. Or other things that are intrinsic should, evils. Yeah, you should not be receiving Holy Communion, or, but all or of other the things, intrinsic evils. Yeah, right? all of the intrinsic evils. So and that's what we're missing right now, is the whole fact is that we're not saying this publicly. Right. This is a public action. It's clearly happening. It's public action. People clearly, it's clearly know that happening. it's happening. It's a total scandal. And uh, the other end of that canon is not kicking in. So, that brings us to what's going on right now. And we're just reporting public facts that you can... I'm not a bishop. You can look up all this stuff online, but we just wanted to kind of give you what's going on in the hierarchy of the church. Uh, Because a lot of people don't, you know, they don't maybe know where to read or what to read. But they're seeing this stuff happen. There's a lot of talk about Catholic politicians voting for this stuff, and it's a scandal. The the other thing I would just say about this, that, that just, yeah, I think this is... It's technical, but it's also, uh, need, we need to have some precision and distinction here. What that canon says is that they are not to receive Holy Communion. Yep. What it does not say explicitly, and there are other canons that weigh in on this, is it does not say explicitly in that canon whether or not it's the job of the priest to withhold it, or how it is to come about that they are to not receive Holy Communion. Right. So, Which is John Paul my... II and Pope Benedict, they go back to the pastor in which they've issued documents which the pastors should be talking about it. In this case, again, we're just reporting, but the United States Catholic Conference of Bishops, or the USCCB, under Archbishop Gomez out of Los Angeles, uh, who is the president of the council, uh, was moving in a particular direction uh, or at least discussion, I should say, in which they were suggesting that they maybe develop a policy or process on how to address this. And had written, uh, is it uh, Cardinal Ladardia? Yes. Uh, who is uh, the head of the CDF, Congregation uh, of the Doctrine of the Faith. And Ladardia writes him back and basically expresses... Um, a few different points, which which were which were very interesting, and we would encourage you to get online. Lots of lots of articles addressing this stuff, but just to just to read a little bit of it, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith urged the U.S. bishops to proceed with caution in their discussions about formulating a national policy to address the situation of Catholics in public office who support legislation um, allowing abortion, euthanasia, or other moral evils. Uh, and so it 
kind of put the brakes on it a little bit and then their suggestions as to what the U.S. bishops or how the U.S. bishops uh, should proceed based upon some stuff that uh, Pope Benedict as well as Pope John Paul II um, had, had, had actually stated in the past. And so just to, you know, this is from 2002, for example. Those who are directly involved, this is Cardinal Ratzinger before he was Pope Benedict XVI. Those who are directly involved in lawmaking bodies have a grave and clear obligation to oppose any law that attacks human life. For them, as every Catholic, it is impossible to promote such laws or vote for them. Okay, so that's the teaching that's we've been talking about. Clear. So Catholic politicians should obviously be voting pro-life. However, the note did not mention anything about the reception of the Eucharist, uh, which, is, which is something to be said, right? Uh, instead, he says his pastor should meet with him, instructing him about the church's teaching, informing him that he is not to present himself for Holy Communion until he brings, this is in 2004, until he brings uh, to an end the objective situation of sin and warning him that otherwise he'll be denied the Eucharist. And this is all these other situations and many more that we were talking about as well. And I can tell you as a pastor, many times it's a very gentle conversation. Usually a process is being worked in which we're, you know, getting that individual, um, you know, from one place, one place to another. Uh, but then Ladardi went on to, you know, basically say that, you know, this could be a point of contention and it should be a point of uh, unanimity. Unanimity. Uh, thank you. And, uh, and, and what was most striking about it is any policy that would, you know, basically weigh in on denying communion at this level has to have, under John Paul II, St. John Paul II, has to have an, a, 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 a majority, or not a majority, but a unanimous vote right. in any bishop's conference, so no matter what country you're in. So that means that if they were to pass a law or a policy on Catholic politicians not receiving communion if they're you know, persisting in, in their voting record against life, right. that every bishop in the country would have to vote for that. In order for in, it to become the policy in, of the in order, USCCB, ex right? Exactly. So, no, in order, yeah, the policy of the USCC, USCCB, but also in order to be recognized by the Vatican as, as, as well, the, legitimate. Yeah, I think... Right, but I think the issue because there there is the also, also the the direct pastoral relationship that a particular bishop, while that person is in their diocese, has with that person, and so he doesn't need a policy from the USCCB. For example, Archbishop Gregory or Correct. Bishop Kagan. All I'm saying is, or, is for that to be a national policy. Right, unanimous vote, everybody. Yep. So if you're out there, and I'm with you. When it comes to Catholic politicians, you know, persisting in grave evil is a scandal to me. However, in order for the bishops to act under St. John Paul II, they have to have a unanimous vote. Right. I don't know how many bishops there are, uh, but that's a lot of bishops. I think there's like four, is there 400 in the United what, States? Whatever it is, that's a, that's, that's, that's a powerful response. So the, the church is coming and basically yeah. saying, Hello, Catholic politician. We are unanimously, uh, yeah. have unanimously decided that we are going to deny you communion based upon these reasons. And so it, I guess my point, everyone, you know, we need to pray for our brothers and sisters who are Catholic, yeah. uh, who are in government, that they would either convert or have the courage to do what, do what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, but I, I got to say this, that, you know, they're not our enemies. They're baptized into the faith. And, you know, we're, we're all part of the same family. We need to pray for We need for to pray them. for our bishops. And this tells, this tells me that, you know, that's a drastic action. So, um, yeah, we, we, need, we need to pray for our bishops. We need to pray for our people. We need to pray for our politicians. We need to pray hard for everybody. But we also need to stand up for the truth. Um, but hopefully this has helped you understand this issue a little bit a little bit, little bit better. It's not an it's, exhaustive look it, at it. It's but certainly I think larger it's, than us. It's definitely larger, larger than us. Than us. That's why this is a little bit longer one. All right, let's get back to this wine. <sighs> it's delicious. I'm enjoying it. It's uh, beautiful. Let's score it. Okay, let's score it. I, I love it. I think it's fabulous. I, I think I'm getting lime. I'm getting kiwi. Start with the color here. I uh, Golden straw. It is one of the... I gotta take these glasses off just to confirm it, which I can. But honestly, everyone, the color of this wine is like just 
gold. Yeah. The bubbles on it are beautiful. Um, like a nectarine almost. Yeah, light coming through it. Golden straw. So I would give it, uh, what's our top color score? 15. 15. A ro aroma of, score? One out of 15? Where are we going? The bouquet. There is just a little of that um, buttery, buttery smoke in the back. But it's not overwhelming. Ground stone. Mm -hmm. I think the aroma it was was better. I just part of me just wants to say Chardonnay grape. I mean, it's really clean. Very clean. It's like it's it's very it's very fruity. clean. I mean, when you smell it, it just invites you in a little bit of melon on there for sure. Yeah. Flowers. Are you getting kiwi? A little bit of kiwi. I would say that's the melon or the fruit for me. Yeah. Fruit forward, definitely. Palette score on this for me is maybe a 22, 23 out of 25. What's what's our what's our nose again? Our bouquet. One uh, out of 15. We're, I'm going to 14 on it. I'll agree with you on that. Pull back just one. 22. But I mean, I, gosh, this is a full wine. Overall I know quality. It's $25, 30. Everybody, but this is this wine. I love whites. If you're a white drinker, you're gonna um, love this one. The palate. I'm giving this a 91. The palate for me. So I had a 15. I had a 14. I call it. Now I'm on the palate. 22 out of 25 is kind of what I'm thinking. The palate is, um, it's juicy. And I just have to say, and I want to go on forever here, but what I'm looking for in a wine is fresh and juicy, red or white, but especially whites. And this is at least this bottle is fresh, totally and juicy. Fresh. It's quenching. It's not too acidic. It's a sit outside with your partner, uh, your friend, or whoever, and uh, have a bowl of musk melon and some fruits. Your partner. You're using the lingo. <laughs> politically correct. The politically correct lingo. <laughs> and uh, that was a slip, just, everybody. Just, that was <laughs> just enjoy your partner. Enjoy your afternoon with whoever. Your you wife want to enjoy it or with. your husband. Right. Or your friend. Or, or your, your friend or your fiance. Yep. Or your boyfriend or your girlfriend. Okay, fair enough. Anyway, but I gotta give him some. I'm gonna grief. I'm gonna give this wine a total of ninety-seven. No. I'm all in for the no for, way. for the level of wine that it is. Oh my gosh. In its own category for twenty-five dollars. It's a wonderful. This, I will buy this, this is a wine. This ninety-seven pointer in its category for twenty-five bucks. That's where it's going to be. I'm I'm a ninety-one, ninety-two. You go out there, you buy it, you drink it. You let us know uh, whether us or not know. this is a ninety-seven. You drink, or it, you drink it with your partner and uh, <laughs> <laughs> let us know. How it goes. No, it's good. It's it's a delicious wine. And so he's giving it a 97, I'm giving it a 91 plus, maybe one or two, but. Um, we're gonna have another one coming your way. Yep. Until next time, I'm Father Justin Waltz. I'm Father Jaden Nelson. And we're two priests. And a bottle of wine. Moving in a direction of a policy slash process that they were looking for a unanimous vote on, on how to address Catholic politicians that are persisting in these grave evils.